This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, Cosmographia Podcast. We have all the usual suspects here. I am Russ. This is my brother, Kyle. We are the hosts. We got Bradley, Randall, and Mike, the normal guy. How are you guys doing? I'm a suspect. <laughs> <laughs> usual one. <laughs> I must say I'm doing quite well myself. All it's right. good to be here again. It is. Yep. Seeing all your exactly. smiling faces, all your shiny faces. Yeah, we're super <laughs> shiny today. Yeah, you guys are super shiny. I see that. <laughs> Subtle. <laughs> <laughs> so last week we ended with, uh, we were working on some of the critics of the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. Yeah, because I and feel like we need to look at all sides of these kind of controversial um, ideas that are out there. Um, don't you? Don't you feel do. like we should? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We do. So, um, yeah, we were talking, I think we kind of ended up discussing the Boslow paper, the paper where he was invoking the Yang paper. That's right. Support his contention that um, there was no evidence for an impact because these microspherals were found in other soil horizons than the Younger Dryas boundary. That was the, the contention of it. But when we actually went into the Yang paper, we discovered that they were pretty open to the idea that these microspherals were the result of a cosmic impact. So uh, jump ahead a little bit, then we'll come back to the critics. Um, because as this, as this research has, has gone on, um, more um, scientists, more geologists particularly, um, have gone back just very much very parallel in a way to the to the KT boundary, the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, when the first iridium layer was discovered um, in uh, Gubbio, Italy. Then the uh, other groups, other teams went back and re-examined the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. First, I know there was a re-examination in Denmark. There was another one in New Zealand. There was another one in Spain. And as a result of that, by going back and looking, taking another look, they discovered the impact proxies. Very similar thing has happened with the Younger Dryas boundary um, um, idea that there was an impact. So others have now gone and uh, taken a closer look. Um, in uh, Central Mexico, we're, we're pushing the, um, the, the extent of the phenomena uh, we're widening the extent. We we talked, I think it was a, last week, maybe the, the week before, we were talking about the evidence found on Santa Rosa Island, right? So this was a, a paper that was published in 2012. Um, Isabel Alcantara, if I'm not butchering her name too much, I hope not. Um, and the title of the paper, which was published in the Proceeding of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, was entitled Evidence from Central Mexico Supporting the Younger Dryas Extraterrestrial Impact Hypothesis. So what they did was they looked in, they took a core from Lake Cuzio. Cuzio, I think is how they it said, something like Cuzio. Um, Again, I'm probably butchering it, but it's fairly close to that. Um, when they uh, took this sample from the bottom of the lake, they were able to find the Younger Dryas Horizon. And we report the discovery in Lake Cuzio in central Mexico of a black carbon-rich lacustrine layer, lacustrine, simply a fancy word for lake, right, containing nanodiamonds, microspherals, and other unusual materials that date to the early Younger Dryas and are interpreted to result from an extraterrestrial impact. Uh, so they took out a 27-meter-long core, which is close to 90 feet, 
as part of an interdisciplinary effort to extract a paleoclimate record uh, back through the previous interglacial, which is generally considered to be the Eemian, which was back over 100,000 years ago, uh, usually invoked as being an interglacial period that's more or less parallel to the Holocene, the one we're in now. So she goes on to say our attention, and there was, she was part of a, a whole team, our attention focused early on, early on an anomalous 10 centimeter thick, so, you know, maybe three inches roughly, carbon rich layer at a de depth of 2.8 meters that dates to 12.9 thousand years ago and co coincides with a suite of anomalous coeval environmental and biotic changes independently recognized in other regional lake sequences. Collectively, these changes have produced the most distinctive boundary layer in the late quaternary record. Now that's really saying something because if you're talking about the quaternary, you're talking about two and a half million years. So they say again, uh, I'll repeat that. Collectively, these changes have produced the most distinctive boundary layer in the late quaternary record. This layer contains a diverse, abundant assemblage of impact-related markers, including nanodiamonds, carbon spherules, and magnetic spherules with rapid melting slash quenching textures. Right, so in other words, the surface melts and then quickly, quickly recrystallizes, right? All, all reaching synchronous peaks immediately beneath a layer containing the largest peak of charcoal in the core. Mm. That's pretty intense stuff right there. Now we're, we're down in central Mexico with that. Let me show you, here's a, I'll do a screen share. Here's a- um, So what they mean by that is, I'm trying to get this right. They, they, you see yeah. all the impact proxies, and then directly above that is a whole bunch of evidence of fire. Is yes. That okay, yeah. Yes, that's exactly it. Yes. So I will do a quick screen share here. We will see some. Here's the lake in central Mexico. Now the lake itself, nobody's claiming that the lake was produced by the impact. Right. In fact, the, the lake, whatever the origin of the lake, it was already there. So the sediment that accumulates on the bottom of the lake, that's, that's the key here. And let's see. You can't really see it on this map. It's, it's right down here in central Mexico. If you can see my, um, my cursor, it's right in this area. It's the second largest lake actually in Mexico. I think we can, do we find it here? It's, uh, I believe this is it right it's just, I think this is it right here. So it's in central Mexico. So if you look at the large scale map, you can see we've suddenly moved the boundary of the Younger Dryas impact evidence. We've extended the range here down into Mexico. Now you uh, said this is, this is the, the largest, uh, the largest, Carbon spike in the quaternary? In the quaternary. Okay. The word, uh, the term uh, that she used is that it's the most distinctive boundary. That's 200, 250 million years. No, 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 no. Two and a half million years. Two and a half million years. Okay. Yeah. Well, and it did say late quaternary, so I'm not sure where that's defined, the late quaternary. Well, I would say the late quaternary, we would probably be extending back through the last interglacial anyway. So given that the whole quaternary is two and a half million years, we're probably looking at a couple of hundred thousand years for the late quaternary. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, but what it does say is it has a, contains the largest peak of charcoal in the core. So... The team goes on to say, we have examined multiple hypotheses to account for these observations and find the evidence cannot be explained by any 
known terrestrial mechanism. It is, however, consistent with the Younger Dryas impact boundary hypothesis, postulating a major extraterrestrial impact involving multiple air bursts. Air burst, now they have the, the, the S in parentheses so that you can read it as a single air burst or multiple air bursts, right? And or, and slash or ground impacts at 12.9. What they don't say here though, which to me is perhaps an omission, is the possibility of impacts into the ice sheet itself. And that's the thing that I wanna be looking at more. And it's certainly part of several of the, of the scenarios because there's not just one variation on this impact hypothesis. There's, a mul there's several variants. Um, in fact, that's one of the things that the, that the critics have, have, have jumped on. They say, well, there's not a single coherent hypothesis here. But, you know, it's, it's just like, again, going back to the Cretaceous tertiary back in the early 80s, there was, of course, not one single hypothesis. You discover this layer of iridium, an anomalous, anomalous iridium layer. So then you begin to speculate, right? You begin to hypothesize. So you have to test those hypotheses. As you'll see that the, the critics have tried to, to, to use the actual scientific method to somehow discredit the idea because right from the very start, there wasn't some coherent model that everybody agreed upon. Um, so then um, the Alcantara paper goes on to say that the Suravel paper, which I'm going to come back to in a second, reported finding no younger driest boundary microspherals uh, I make, excuse me, magnetic spherules, no peaks of magnetic spherules, although they claimed to follow the protocols of Richard Firestone and his team, which they laid out very explicitly how they step by step went through these sedimentary um, samples that they were looking at, these aliquots, and were able to then filter out the, 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 the non-impact material because the impact material, you're talking about maybe a few hundred parts per million, right? So it'd be very easy to get lost if you don't have the proper procedure in place to isolate that stuff. You see what I'm saying? Um, so uh, their sieve was too big or something. Their sieve was too large. That was one of them. That was one of the factors. I'll come back to that just a second, because that is, that is one of the things that, that Malcolm Lecomte's paper addressed was okay. how they sit the sieve, the sieve that they used because yeah. right. If the aperture apertures are too big, it's because the things you're looking at are extremely small. See? So, I mean, you've got to use a sieve that's very small, uh, appropriate, you know, of corresponding size. Otherwise, too much stuff comes through. And right. now you've got to filter through too much stuff to find the, the little, uh, the, the, the magnetic grains and the nano diamonds and so on. Um, so there, the, the, the uh, Alcantara team goes on to say that, um, that the Suravel paper claimed, uh, concluded that the Firestone team misidentified or miscounted the microspherals, the, uh, sorry, the, the, the magnetic spherules. Uh, later, Lecomte, Malcolm Lecomte, and his team independently examined two Younger Dryas boundary sites uh, common to Firestone and Suravel, right? They reported that, here's quote, spheral abundances are consistent with those of Firestone at Al and inconsistent with the results of Suravel at Al. They also concluded that Suravel et al. altered the prescribed magnetic spheral protocol in fatal ways, particularly by not observing requirements for sample thickness, sample weight, and size sorting. We consider these discrepancies significant, significant enough to negate the conclusion of Suravel et al. Um, so, um, Let's go to the, the, the Suravel paper. Um, this is Todd Suravel at Al. Um, 
published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2012. He says, herein, we report the results of an independent analysis of magnetic minerals and magnetic microspherals from seven sites of similar age, including Blackwater Draw, New Mexico, and Topper, South Carolina, both examined by Firestone et al. In all seven sites, we found no distinct peak in magnetic grains or microspherals uniquely associated with the Younger Dryas and therefore find no support for an extraterrestrial cause of the Younger Dryas event and New World Pleistocene extinctions. Okay. So, so they go on to say in both of the resampled sites, okay, resampling going to the sites, presumably um, where Firestone team took their samples, uh, and our additional sites using methods taken from Firestone et al., we failed to reproduce their results. We have found no peaks in magnetic particles or magnetic microspherals unique to 12.9 thousand year ago level in any of our sample sites that were significantly different from peaks in these materials at other levels in the stratigraphy. The situation is the case even at Blackwater Draw, where our samples were collected within a few centimeters of the sections previously sampled. Assuming an ET impact occurred, now this is, this is uh, I think this is fair on, on what they're now saying, and because they're leaving a little crack in there, um, and, and sort of a, a, a tacit admission, right? They say, assuming an ET impact occurred, perhaps the lack of reproducibility indicates that the methods used for recovering the magnetic material are not appropriate for the task at hand. Uh huh. So then, um, Boslow, back to Mark Boslow, he says, um, magnetic microspheral abundant. This was, um, published in Climates, Landscapes, and Civilizations, part of the Geophysical Monograph series. Um, magnetic microspheral abundance results published by the impact proponents have not been reproducible by other workers. Analysis of the same Younger Dryas site stratigraphy by Suravel et al. could not replicate observations for two of the impact markers published by Firestone. The study by Suravel et al. found no peaks of abundance unique to the Younger Dryas time interval. So now, what happened is, is the Suravel paper pretty much became the basis upon which all subsequent refutations of the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis were based. His team's inability to replicate the, the work of the Firestone team that was published in 2007. This is making sense so far. Yeah. So um, I can actually go here. Let's see. Um, it, it doesn't make sense though, is if, if all they're saying is that they couldn't replicate the peaks and that the microspherals that they did find were not irregular or like were no different than anywhere else in the stratigraphy, how would a, a sieve size result in that because if they're using the same size sieve but they're fine. We'll, we'll address we'll address that i want to show you this though so you see how how it works i'm going to do well, a screen share it even sounded to me like well they did it within a few centimeters but sometimes that that boundary may be only a centimeter thick so yeah, if they're yeah. a few centimeters off yeah they're going to miss it yeah okay so this is this is now from how mainstream media um, covered this. You see, you see this? Experts yeah. find no evidence for a mammoth killer impact. A devastating cosmic collision 13,000 years ago continues to play well in the media, but specialists are challenging the grounds for thinking it happened. So it's a good thing now that the experts have weighed in because Douglas Kennett and James Kennett and Alan West and Wendy Wolbach and Richard Firestone and Chris Moore and da 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 da. These people are apparently not, not experts. experts. Yeah. Ted Bunch is not an expert. 
Okay. We, 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 um, so, um, so that, there was one example. Uh, let's see here. Here's, here's another one. Comet impact theory disproved. New data published today disproves the recent theory that a large comet exploded over North America 12,900 years ago, causing a shock wave that traveled across North America at hundreds of kilometers per hour and triggering continent-wide continent -wide wildfires. So um, here, this is interesting. Dr. Sandy Harrison from the University of Bristol and colleagues tested the theory by examining charcoal and pollen records to assess how fire regimes in North America changed between 15 and 10,000 years ago, a time of large and rapid climate changes. Their results provide no evidence for continental scale fires. Now bear in mind, they're just looking at basically one site, but support the fact that the increase in large scale wildfires in all regions of the world during the past decade is related to an increase in global warming. Oh, surprise, surprise. Okay, do you see how there's, there's uh, an important indicator here that there's politics at work? Uh, uh, agenda. And now, interestingly, though, here, look what they say here. They found clear changes in biomass burning and fire frequency whenever climate changed abruptly. And most particularly when temperatures increased at the end of the Younger Dryas cold phase. So right there, you see what's happening? When the climate changes, they're seeing an abundance of fires. Well, why would that be? Well, multiple reasons. One reason would be, of course, when you have abrupt, large-scale, or catastrophic changes in climate. And these are just not happening. There's something driving that. That's the point, right? But when you have a large-scale shift in climate, what happens to the vegetation that is adapted to that particular climate that suddenly is completely different? It dies Dying. off. When it dies off, what does it do? It, it creates the basis for large-scale fires. See, that work didn't disprove anything, really. All it did was confirm that yeah, there are other episodes of very large-scale fires that have occurred and left their mark. However, as the Alcantara team pointed out, in their particular um, uh, core sample that they took from the bottom of the lake, that layer, like they said, is the most distinctive layer of the late quaternary. And the largest charcoal um, deposit that they found in the entire core. So, anyways, I think we should just continue on here. Um, so... Going back to Basel, so now you see basically that that what has happened here is is that you know it's almost like you have this faction that is ready to jump on anything that relieves them of having to address this heresy. The heresy being, yeah, planet Earth got its ass kicked twelve thousand nine hundred years ago, it which the scale and magnitude of the event would have profoundly affected the human species. Unlike the Cretaceous tertiary event, this was one where humans participated in this, in this phenomena. And, and that's the most critically important insight, I think, to take away from this. Because when we look at, at you know, basically the rise of what we consider modern history, Right? What do we see? I mean, we see you go in and you do the research into the dispersal of languages, right? And we're back to 10,000 years ago. If we talk about the general domestication of animals, the beginning of agriculture, the first cities, we're looking at eight to 10,000 years ago, aren't we? And in it's, all, not, it's yeah. not just that humans participated, but that they were victims as opposed to instigators. That's another thing. They yes. Don't. Yeah. Yes. Um, exactly. Um, so going back to, 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 um, you know, what we were talking about last week where the Boslow team was attempting to discredit the idea by saying these proxies are found in other levels as well, which is true. However, are they dispersed? Are they more widely dispersed or are they found in the same levels of concentration that we see at the, at the YDB, the Younger Dryas Boundary? So at the end of the last um, episode, I asked this question, how do these results, the results of Yang, and if you haven't seen that episode, you should get back and watch that. Um, 
How do these results negate the findings of Kennett and others as the Boslo team implies? The fact that the spherules were found in more recent sediments, Boslo and others try to use to discredit the work of the, of the Kennett team. But now I ask you to consider this carefully. The fact that the Yang team found spherules containing nanodiamonds in more recent sediments than the Younger Dryas boundary means, according to Boslo and his guys, that, quote, they were evidently not produced by impact processes because they are present in modern soil and lack any links to impact structures. Um, again, how is this conclusion in any way supported by the findings of Yang et al. when they actually invoke impact as a plausible explanation? So then I asked the question, what are these uh, impact produced spherules doing in recent soils? And I would suggest that the findings, and these were from samples taken in Germany and Belgium, okay, that the other way of interpreting it is if there's other horizons with, <laughs> with what are clearly identified as impact proxies does not disprove that you had an impact at the Younger Dryas boundary, but simply provides evidence that maybe impact events are far more frequent than have, have been previously recognized. Um, right. um, you you well, last week we talked about the, the other possibility is, is redeposition. Yeah. Redeposition, and, and exactly. Course, not finding a crater doesn't mean that the there crater doesn't one. exist. <laughs> yeah. Right, so, right. No known structure. Right. Is different. Yeah. No yes. structure exists. So then they also uh, talk about another paper. I T I A N T I A N T A N team again. Pro the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, published in two thousand eleven. They studied the Y D boundary in Belgium, um, and that particular team uh, was referenced actually by the Alcantara team, um, who were studying the core samples from the bottom of Lake Cuzio. Uh, so anyways, Boslo, looking at Alcantara's work, who referenced Tian or Tian, if you can follow this now, state that, that Alcantara and others, quote, Tian or Tian, et al. as independent confirmation of cubic nanodiamonds in Younger Dryas boundary sediments. However, they do not mention that only a limited range of sediment horizons above and below the Belgium Younger Dryas boundary were studied in that work. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. And so what? I got to ask that. Further, and going on with the quote here, further, they do not mention the results of Yang et al., which taken together with Tian et al. suggest that nanodiamonds may be distributed throughout the Belgian sediments. So now they're bringing the Yang team's work back in, which we've already addressed and shown that it, it does in no way refute the idea of an impact and, in fact, actually supports it. Okay. So now... So is it is their problem they're trying to point are they, are they trying to imply that because they didn't check everything that that's why you know they're like saying well what if they're everywhere you guys didn't actually look is yes that what that's what they're say? saying okay. okay so the the TN team made a study of the uh, of a thin black layer that was about twenty inches beneath the surface near I don't know how you say it Lamel L O M M E L Belgium. So they begin their paper by briefly describing the history of the impact controversy, controversy mentioning two critics of the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, Paquet, who in, in, in substance is not much different than Suravel, and Suravel. Tian and others point out that these two teams failed to replicate the findings of the impact proponents. The electron microscopy data put forward by the Kennett team, this is Kennett, West, Firestone, these are the proponents, right, demonstrate the presence of Lons Delight at the Younger Dryas boundary. And the TN team claims that this is unconvincing. But then they go on to state, um, with regard to the report of the Kennett team, although, and I'm quoting now, although the reported lattice parameters 
of this is how you, the lattice parameters, is how you identify a crystal, can indeed be assumed to originate from Lon's delight. Low precision measurements from ring patterns resulting from small particles can at most be seen as a first indication. So, so basically what they're saying is that the hexagonal nanodiamonds that was identified by the, the Kennett team, they're not convinced by it. Sure, fair enough. But they're also admitting that, well, this is only a first indication. And that would probably be exactly what the Kennett team would say too. That, it, that it's a first indication and we need more studies, more, a, a bigger sample base. Um, but it can readily be seen that TN and others does not exclude the possibility that the Kennett team did in fact discover Lon's Delight. And Lon's Delight is a very definitive proxy for impacts, right? And actually gave a half-hearted support to the interpretation. When they get to the subject of their own findings, TN and his team report that, and I quote now, our findings confirm and in fact reveal more direct proof than the earlier studies for the existence of diamond nanoparticles also in this European Younger Dryas boundary layer. Now, last sentence of the quote, no such particles are found in the overlying silt and clay, or in the underlying fine sands. So in other words, they did look at the contiguous layers. Uh, Here's the boundary. They looked in the layers above. They looked in the layers below. They didn't find them. But they did find them right at the Younger Dryas boundary. Now go back and think of what, what, what Boslo said. You see, right, what we're getting. Yeah, he, yeah. he misrepresented it. He, he misrepresented their work. There were no spikes at the, la at the boundary. Yeah. And obviously were. yeah. So again, I have to ask, how is it that the work of Yang et al. and Tian et al. disproves or even discredits the findings of the Kenna team? Is it beginning to appear that we're witnessing a contrived attempt to discredit the findings of the Kenna team? And returning to the work of uh, Isabel Alcantara and her 15 member team, we find powerful independent corroboration of the work of Firestone and others. Their paper describing research that supports the impact hypothesis was published in March of 2012. Um, so their sample that they were studying was 88.5, 88 and a half feet long, four inches in diameter, right? Four inches, 88 and a half feet long. And it provided a detailed record of regional environmental and climatic changes back to 130,000 years. So um, by the time this article was published in 2012, some of these challenges from these other workers had been, that had now come in and were being directed at the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis. Um, so the Alcantara team therefore make it clear that, and I'm quoting from their paper, because of the controversial nature of the Younger Dryas impact debate, we have examined a diverse assemblage of YDB markers at Le Cuzio using a more comprehensive array of analytical techniques than in previous investigations. In addition, Different researchers at multiple institutions confirmed key results. So amongst those comprehensive array of analytical techniques, without going into me the methodology, you had transmission electron microscopy, you had high resolution transmission electron microscopy, you had accelerator mass spectroscopy, you had energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, you had fast Fourier transform analysis, and electron energy loss spectroscopy, or EELS. Suffice it to say that these technologies allow of the highest precision and accuracy for the identification of the relevant materials. So they went all out to try to determine, right? So the thing that first caught their attention that led to all of this was the, the anomalously high amount of charcoal that they found there. Um, so they, they concentrated on counting charcoal micropa, micro particles 
between the depths of 11.8 and 7.2 feet in depth. So this interval dates from approximately 21,000 to about 10,000 years ago, right? So you got 11.8 feet down, which is going to be the lowest, the oldest, right? And then it's 7.2 feet. So now you've got 21,000 years ago down here, 10,000 years ago here, okay? The background level of charcoal particles was about 5,000 particles per kilogram of sediment. So this is diffused throughout that several feet there, right? So at a depth of 3.1 meters, which is just a little under 10 feet, dating to about 16,000 years ago, they found a minor peak of 29,000 particles per kilogram. Okay, so background throughout, you just sample randomly 5,000 particles per kilogram is what they were able to isolate. At, uh, so at the, at the 3.1 meters, 16,000 years ago, they found a peak, a spike of 29,000 particles per kilogram. When they looked at the onset of the Younger Dryas boundary, which was at a depth of 2.65 meters, they found a peak of 77,000 particles per kilogram or 15 times greater than the background count. This the authors attribute to, and I quote, a major episode of biomass burning. This peak in charcoal particles is found about five centimeters above a layer containing magnetic spherules, carbon spherules, and nano diamonds. So, it appears that at this location, there was a major episode of biomass burning um, followed immediately by deposition of three unique type, or, or that followed immediately the deposition of three unique types of impact proxy material. Then they also pointed out that, there's, that their Lake Yaguada, again, I might be butchering the name, L E. Y-E-G-U-A-D-A, -E in Panama, they discovered that there's also a major peak of charcoal particles that date to the onset of the Younger Dryas. Um, so, quoting the team again, for Lake La Yaguada, although the wide Younger Dryas episode was not expressly identified, the workers there did recognize a major environmental a major abrupt environmental and ecological change, which they referred to as a time of crisis. Close to the onset of the Younger Dryas at approximately 12.8 thousand years ago, this is reflected in dramatic changes in the pollen and diatom records, biotic turnover, clay mineralogy, sedimentary geochemistry, and particulate carbon flux. So these two lakes are separated by about 1,500 miles. So right there you can see, well, biomass burning, biomass burning dating to the same point, deposition of impact proxies, 1,500 miles apart. And now we're finding the same stuff up in North America. It's now we've reached as far south as Panama. So the author's right. Uh, in summary, from widely separated lakes in the highlands of Costa Rica, let's see, okay, so let me, let me point out though first that this is, uh, that, that not only in Lake Cuzio and Lake La Yaquada, there are other lakes as well, okay, that the authors don't get into in detail, but they mention them. And so in summary, they write that from widely separated lakes in the highlands of Costa Rica to the lowlands of Guatemala and Pan Panama, there is only one stratigraphic interval that displays extraordinary environmental and biotic changes. And in each case, this interval occurs at or near the Younger Dryas onset. So. I know this is sort of, this is sort of an aside, but it's just, as you're talking about all this, I'm, I'm just imagining sort of in fast forward, all of the deposition in these lakes over the years, you know, I mean, the cores that they had, what did you say, 150,000 years? Well, this particular 28 20, or 88 foot long core 
Yeah. Covered 130,000 years. 130,000 years. I don't know why, but I was just having an image in my mind of this. And it's like, it's just really fascinating that, that there's this forensic evidence just being laid down of all, all of this. What, yeah, lakes, the history are, like, of the lakes world. are like perfect capture devices yes. for this guy. Well, they stuff. are. Yes, they are. It's um, fascinating. Very much it's cool. like tree rings almost because you have seasonal deposition in the lakes. Right. Annual deposition that's very clearly can be identified. Right. I was thinking like all the layer. leaves in the fall landing on the lakes, sinking to the bottom. Yeah. All of yes. the fish and the, the cycles that the animals go and through right. every year. Right. The, the rainy periods where you have yeah. much more uh, material flushed into the lakes. Yes. Right. So you can look at a sequence and it'll be quite regular. And but then now, you see breakups of the pattern. and Then you see, yes. Then you see interruptions of the normal pattern. So right yeah. there, that should be something that, that, that gets your attention. And it does. Yeah. They look at it. And, and so fascinating. It totally is. I mean, it's very much detective work. Yeah. Looking at clues. And this, you know, this is why I've used kind of the, the analogy of, of footprints and fingerprints. You know, footprints you can see with the naked eye, right? They're, they're like things that you can see in the landscape. A coulee would be a footprint. A, a dry cataract would be a footprint. A, 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 uh, an erratic iceberg rafted boulder, a footprint, right? A, a huge boulder bar, a footprint. Fingerprints are the things that you have to have technological assistance in order to detect. Right. So that would include the nano diamonds and the magnetic grains and the microspherals and the iridium spikes and so on. Right. Like, and the and the crater is like the murder weapon. The crater <laughs> is the yeah, gun. the crater is the smoking <laughs> gun. Absolutely. <That's> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And in fact, it was the discovery of the Chicxulub crater in Mexico that pretty much finally um got the most of the critics of the of the kt impact hypothesis to shut up although again it's not as clean as you would like because you know one of the one of the primary things and th this same criticism applied to the younger dryas impact idea as applied to the cretaceous tertiary impact idea that well it seems like there were like some losses of species that were, you know, before the actual impact boundary where the iridium was found, likely true. However, when we begin to look at the planet, what we have to understand, just like what's going on now, for several days down in the Philippines, we've been now having this volcanic eruption. Leading up to it, you had, you had tremors, you had things that, you, you know, you had things happening, right? In the aftermath, you have things happening, you know? Um, and that's the point is that, no, you can't, it, you can't just oversimplify these things, you know, to say, see, here's the assumption. Well, if it's an impact, it just is one thing, boom, that's all done. It's over with. So there would only be one horizon where something actually should, should have happened. But what that is, is an oversimplified model of the, of the impact evidence and the impact ideas. And just like at the KT boundary, there's evidence that we had an a, a what would I call it an impact epoch, a, a period where you had multiple impacts. Now, the the Great Chicxulub crater would have been uh, most likely the the greatest and and had the most profound effect. But you know, even a, a, something that leaves a crater ten miles in diameter, as expo, expo, uh, as compared to the hundred and thirty or hundred and fifty miles that the Chicxulub crater is, even a, an impact event that leaves a ten mile crater is still going to have a global impact. It's still going to affect the climate. It's still going to have maybe not global extinctions, but certainly regional disruptions, regional, maybe even continental-wide extinctions. So the fact that you might look in, in 50,000 years before the actual iridium layer, there appears to have been some disruption, then does not negate the impact at the, at the KT boundary any more than finding that there was an event that happened at 14,006 negates the possibility of an impact at 12,900. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So then we get to the uh, to the LeCompte paper, um, 
And let's just do a screen share here. I also think that we, we don't really know what the, what, what is a, uh, I've said this before, what's a normal rate of extinction? We just don't have enough data to say anything about that yet, right? Like, what, what, how often are things going extinct all the time? What, what could we say that there's a normal rate of uh, well, yes, losing? There, there has been. You know, the gradualist models would say that any given time, roughly 10% of the species are in the process of going extinct. Okay. 10% of species, replacement species, are in the process of evolving to fill those, you know, those vacated niches in the you know in the biosphere that's good and 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 you know i'm not saying that that's not going on right but the whole point of like going back to stephen jay gould with his idea of punctuated equilibrium yeah is that that yeah that normal pace of change gets interrupted from time to time and really those interruptions the, are where the action is right and what's the rate of that 10 percent die off and replacement what are they what what kind of time span are we talking here millions of years well uh, yeah ongoing like it's it's an ongoing process right, so 10 percent is is going extinct over millions of years is that what they mean you know what i'm saying that's what i'm talking about pretty like, much yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. so no one's going extinct in short time spans <laughs> right <laughs> although I mean. we have seen extinctions in the last two centuries yes we have and, and we need to talk about that because um it's important to understand how those extinctions occurred and why they occurred. Uh, most of them were insular um, species that were, had a very limited habitat, such as on islands. Specialized, um, yeah. Yeah, very specialized. And it was the introduction mostly of invasive species that pretty much then became uh, competitors for the ecological niches of the, of the, uh, the, the species. The species. And it was in the, the competition. Um, yeah. But and, even Go ahead, back, Kyle. The ten percent thing is still a a a wild guess. Yeah, because we're still. <laughs> I mean, we're in the process of discovering new species of bugs and whatnot all the time. We have no idea what's going on in the bottom of the ocean everywhere. Mm -hmm. So it's or like in the depths of the jungles in a lot of places, right? I mean, it's how. Well, it what seems it does like it's going to be a wild guess, yeah. no matter what. You know, you it, could. Here's to me the value of the whole uniformitarian paradigm. It gives us a baseline from which to work. And it also gives us a context for understanding the things that have not happened gradually, you see. Okay. And, 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 and the I'll problem it. is it's become, you know, it's, it became dogma, you know, like we talked about. It's become dogma in the late 19th, early 20th century, and anything that departed from that dogma was considered to be pseudoscientific or, you know, hey, you're trying to bring the, you know, biblical literalism back. You know, they were afraid of the Noah's flood scenarios. They were afraid of the, um, you know, the young earth people, the 6,000 years. And, you know, I would say I can't blame them for that. But, you know, like we said, I think last episode, they threw the baby out with the bathwater by rejecting you know, any, any departure from the uniformitarian model. And this is why J. Harlan Bretz met with such resistance when he proposed his catastrophic flood hypothesis in the, in the 1920s. Yeah. So then as a result of the independent evaluation by the Suravel team, we had another independent evaluation that followed uh, on the Suravel team by led by Malcolm Lecompte, along with Albert C. Goodyear. Um, Mark Demetroff. Now, uh, Brad will remember Goodyear. We went down and we toured the Topper site um, with with Al um, and Graham Hancock. What was that? Two years ago now, a year, right? Two plus. somewhere like that. Uh, and then we we participated in a in a roundtable discussion um, there at um, I think the George Howard set up uh, beautiful whatever that was, golf course resort. Uh, and Mark Demetroff, one of the authors of this, was there. Let's see, who else? Nobody else. So Malcolm was there, Al Goodyear and Mark Demetroff, they were all there. And we, we had a great discussion, good time. We went out in the field with um, Al and, and got to see the topper site. Um, so we'll, we'll probably be sharing photos of that. Although Graham Hancock gets into that, the a discussion of the topper site in America before. 
which if you haven't read it, that, that would be a very good read. And if you haven't read um, uh, Magicians of the Gods, uh, he gets into the Younger Dryas hypothesis in there and goes into some good detail. And, you know, and he's a good writer, so it, it's an entertaining read. And both are available as Audible books read by him, which are fantastic. So for people who don't have time to read as much, those are great as well. Yeah, like, you know, listen to it when you're driving or whatever. That's right, yeah. Right. We also had uh, Chris Moore that joined us at, right. at Topper and then took us to a Carolina Bay site. And then Mike was actually with us there that day also. That's so, right. Yeah, we had a crowd, though he wasn't at Wilmington. Um, yeah, more, more of those guys' evidence are going to keep coming forth here as we get into Chris Moore, too. Yeah, and Chris Moore um, – Great guy, and, and I would say one of the now the leading proponents of the Younger Dryas impact, who, according to what he told me, he started out as a skeptic. Right. Yeah. Uh, so now here's what the Lecompte paper says in the, in the abstract. Firestone et al. sampled sedimentary sequences at many sites across North America, Europe, and Asia. In sediments dated to the Younger Dryas onset or boundary, YDB, approximately 12,900 calendar years ago, Firestone et al. reported discovery of markers including nanodiamonds, a cineform soot, which is a type of soot that forms in catastrophic wildfires, high temperature melt glass, and magnetic microspherals attributed to cosmic impact airbursts which of course invokes the, the, the scenario of Tunguska, which was an airburst. The microspherals were explained as either cosmic material ablation or terrestrial ejecta from a hypothesized North American impact that initiated the abrupt Younger Dryas cooling. It contributed to megafaunal extinctions and triggered human cultural shifts and population declines. A number of independent groups have confirmed the presence of Younger Dryas boundary spherules, but two have not. One of them, Suravel et al., which we have been talking about, collected and analyzed samples from seven Younger Dryas boundary sites, purportedly using the same protocol as Firestone, but did not find a single spheral in Younger Dryas boundary sediments at two previously reported sites. To examine this discrepancy, we conducted an independent blind investigation of two sites common to both studies and a third site investigated only by the Suravel team. So what did they find? We found abundant Younger Dryas boundary microspherals at all three widely separated sites consistent with the results of Firestone et al. and conclude that the analytical protocol employed by Suravel et al. deviated significantly from that of Firestone et al. Morphological and geochemical analysis of the Younger Dryas boundary spheral suggests that they are not cosmic in the sense of the, the, the steady rain of cosmic particles, which, which is what, what Boslow and some of the critics have been saying is that these, these, these things are part of the, the steady uniform accretion uh, uh, or raining upon the earth and not indicative of a singular event. So instead, they appear to have formed uh, from abrupt melting and quenching of terrestrial materials. So I don't know when this happened, but wasn't there a similar paper that was trying to claim that the melt glass could be made in uh, like campfires, and campfires stuff. and stuff. There was a well. You wouldn't campfires wouldn't be hot enough to make melt glass or something, something like that. Yeah. Burning of villages. Uh, it wasn't yes, because all these sites were at paleo, like um, yeah. Clovis sites and stuff that where they were actually digging and finding this stuff. The claim was that the burning, yeah, was uh, was human intentional, right? Making the melt glass. Mm -hmm. There was about that they were digging in syria looking at some stuff in syria oh yeah yeah i remember that well yeah. that's a be a good thing to address um at some point um but house fires will not make nano diamonds so normal house fires will not make nano diamonds no, <laughs> no. yeah nope they won't if they did we would all have a lot of diamonds uh where did we leave it uh 
So I want to know about the, these methods, like when they're saying they deviated from the methods used by Firestone at all, um, it's who's relevant. to say whose methods are correct? I'm just playing the devil's advocate. How, how do they, you know, what if it was Firestone et al's methods that created a false positive? Well, you have, you ha yeah, you get, so you have to look at the methods and you have to look at the fact that, you know, again, you have to have, so Firestone defined their protocols. Right. Suravel said that they were consistent with the protocols. Here comes, a, 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 and didn't find anything. Now here comes the LeCompte team and says, well, they didn't use the same protocols and we did. And they go into great detail explaining the protocols that they used. And, and they came up with, what, four or five different things um, that showed that the Suravel team uh, deviated. Um, they did the test wrong. So, okay. Because it's one thing to – because, yeah, that was basically my – so what the, what the LeCompte team is saying is you, you can't – accurately define what you're looking at with the messes, me methods that the Suravel team used is kind of what they're saying. Yeah. Yes. That's pretty much it. Yes. So have um, they, has the Suravel team responded to that? Has there been a. Not that I have seen. Silence. I don't think so. I don't think, I think it's been pretty much silence. Um, Rage war with silence. <laughs> yeah. So if we go through some some of the, the the inconsistencies here so the first thing they did um was that um they found what they said were five deficiencies in the Suravel protocols um so here's what what the the LeCompte team says firestone team identified the ydb as being a thin layer containing increased abundances of markers and collected samples at several sites, uh, at seven sites with YDB thicknesses ranging from 0.5 to 5 centimeters, averaging 2.3 centimeters. So 2.3 centimeters is, is pretty small, 0.3.37 time, what would I say, uh, times 2.3. So that's, you know, that's less than an inch, right? So their average sampling strata was an inch, right? Suravel collected samples ranging up to 28 centimeters. So now, so their samples were a, almost a foot. So the, the Firestone team sampled a layer only an inch thick, Suravel up to nearly a foot thick. Hmm. Now, if you're looking for that needle in the haystack, you see what happens when suddenly your, 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 your sample base is 11 or 12 times more material that you've got to now look your, into yeah. to find. Um, so as they say, um, consequently, spheral abundance would be diluted, making right. them more difficult to detect. In five of seven instances, Suravel et al. collected samples greater than 10 centimeters thickness. Although this is thicker than recommended, we do not consider this to represent a major flaw by itself. However, it becomes of greater potential importance when combined with other deviations from the Firestone protocol. So deficiency two, inadequate aliquot size, which is just aliquot is your sample base, right? So, the Firestone protocol analyzed one or more 100 to 200 milligram aliquots. Microspherals are usually rare, often making it necessary to inspect the entire magnetic fraction. Suravel and his team examined, examined 10 to 40 milligrams per sample and did not investigate the entire magnetic fraction at any sample. So, in other words, the amount of magnetic grains that Suravel and his team examined was inadequate 
to be statistically significant, invalidating any conclusions regarding spheroidal abundances. Suravel et al. examined from 20 to 100 times smaller aliquots of the magnetic fraction than did the Firestone team, with the result that they found no spherules in five out of seven Younger Dryas boundary layers. This deficiency, and this is, I'm quoting now from the LeCompte paper, this deficiency is a major contributor to their reported lack of spherules because the aliquots analyzed by Suravel et al. were of insufficient size to visually detect even a single spherule. Deficiency three, size sorting of grains. The Firestone Protocol, we used uh, American Society of Testing and Materials, ASTM sieves, to screen the magnetic grains into separate fractions and most worked mostly with less than 150 micrometer samples, right? Suravel, et cetera, their samples were passed through a number 18 one millimeter sieve. sieve. So the LeCompte team then says size sorting of the extracted magnetic grains is essential to overcome the difficulty in detecting rare spherules among the far more numerous non-spherical magnetic grains. We estimate a ratio of sphericals to grains of approximately 1 to 10,000. Our spheral counts indicate that the portion containing the smallest grains, less than 53 micrometers, accounts for 90% of the total spheral abundance. Thus, eliminating larger grains greatly reduces the probability of these obscuring small spherules and also enhances spheral prevalence, making spherules easier to detect. So in other words, they used a seam, a sieve with this really small aperture that filtered out all of this stuff because what they're looking for is down in the micrometer range of size. So then the Suravel, as they said, they used an 18, uh, a number 18, one millimeter sieve. So their, their holes basically that they're passing this through are way bigger than what the Firestone team did. So the, the LeCompte team set points out that size sorting also addresses a more serious problem, which is to overcome the downward migration of microspherules, also known as downward fining. This phenomenon well known in sedimentology is the process by which agitation of sediments results in fine particles preferentially migrating downward through the voids between the larger grains, thereby concentrating larger grains at the top and smaller grains at the bottom. Common sense. Panning for this gold. Fin- what? <laughs> Panning for gold. That's how it works. You yeah, shake. exactly. Exactly. Nuggets coming to the top. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. So this phenomenon is particularly applicable to spheral counting because spherules tend to be much smaller on average than non spherulitic magnetic grains. Size sorting counters downward fining. Neglecting to size sort, an investigator might extract a small aliquot of unsorted, spheral depleted material from the top of the container. The end result is the mistaken conclusion that spherules are absent from the entire magnetic sample, whereas they are only absent from the top of the container. Based upon the published methodology adopted by Suravel et al., size sorting was not conducted. Deficiency four, perfect sphericity. Suravel et al. deviated from the Firestone et al. protocol by independently devising a more restrictive optical criteria for selecting spheral candidates. They limited the spheral count to only those particles matching an extreme degree of sphericity. Even though both the protocol and spheral images published by Firestone and others indicate that spherules commonly do deviate from perfect sphericity. By incorporating such a condition into their protocol, Suravel et al. would most likely have rejected candidates such as the rough spherules shown in figures five and seven 
which I'll show you in a second here in a minute, as well as lumpy spherules rich in rare earth elements found at other sites. Based on our results from light microscopy and scanning electron microscopy, we find that perfect sphericity is not necessarily a defining characteristic of younger driest boundary spherules. And so, because Suravel et al. utilized this additional step, it is possible they eliminated a significant percentage of younger driest spherules uh, present. Our work indicates that Suravel et al. did not follow three of the most critical elements of the Firestone protocol. Size sorting of the magnetic fraction, the examination of sufficient amounts of magnetic material, examination of candidate spherules by scanning electron microscopy and energy dispersive spectroscopy. The result of these emissions was a methodology whose sensitivity was inadequate to detect significant numbers of spherules in any stratum except perhaps those with abundant large spherules, um, as have been found in other, a few other cases. We emphasize that future independent S investigators testing for the presence or absence of younger driest boundary magnetic spherules include, as standard procedure, rigorous size sorting, as well as scanning electron microscopy and energy dispersive spectroscopy analysis. At all three sites tested, grain size sorting using the 53 micrometer screen greatly improved the ratio of spherules to distractor grains, profoundly reducing the difficulties in searching, identifying, and accurately counting these small objects. So here you have the Firestone team. They used all of these particular protocols that we just described here in detail. Here comes the Sur Suravel team, claimed that they used the same protocols but it turns out they didn't. And there, there was one more uh, important fact too that, that we didn't get into here. And that is that where they extracted their samples deviated considerably from the sites where Firestone and his team extracted their samples. So if you don't precisely sample that proper horizon, well, yeah, you're not gonna find anything there anyway. See? Yeah. So. So how, do, how does that get past the peer review? I mean, if, if they're going out to disprove or verify what somebody else's work has been, why would they not have to use the exact same protocols and why would the peer review not know Be that? Well, okay, in? this is a reflection on the process of peer review. For yeah. one thing, the peer reviewers are not knowing. They're accepting everything that the Suravel team says at face value. So what has to happen then is another completely independent team Firestone team, Suravel team, now the third independent team, who we've just been quoting from, the, right. um, the, the, the LeCompte team, they go out and, and make excruciating efforts to adhere to every protocol that the Firestone team utilized. And they came up with confirming what, what Firestone and his team found, see? Now, all three of these are peer reviewed, right? But now, those peer reviewers looking at the Suravel stuff, they haven't been out in the field and, and, and nobody has gone out to challenge them. See, if, if, if the LeCompte team had not gone out and challenged them, their, you know, their conclusions may still dominate the discussion. But see, the LeCompte team was a completely independent team, as was the Alcantara team in Mexico. They were completely independent of Firestone. Now, Subsequent to that, those teams have joined forces. Yes, they have um, subsequently. And so the, 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 the Comet research team has grown from originally, what, 15, 16, 17 members to over 50 some members, say worldwide, that through various, you know, uh, investigations have concluded that there is validity to this. Now, they, they don't necessarily... Um, you know, all agree on exactly the same scenario. Just like they still don't agree exactly on the same scenario for the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. There are variants of the theory and there probably always will be. But the question what comes down to is between the, 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 the impact proponents is that yes, we know something catastrophic happened. It left significant fingerprints in the stratigraphic record. It's associated with the 
with rapid climate change right there at the same record. It's, it's associated with the, the, the extinction of the megafauna. It's associated with major disruptions and declines in human settlement patterns, right? Now, all of these things correlate with this younger driest boundary. So you've got this team who's basically saying it's all coincidence, right? That's, that's the mainstream. That's the Boslow, the Suravel, the Pintar, several others that have, have basically attempted to suppress this idea by, by saying that it's, you know, outlandish, it's outrageous. We don't need that because we've got it all figured out, basically. So yeah. did they, I mean, it just seems to me like they did that on purpose. They didn't follow the rigorous methods. Yeah, I was going to ask that too. Do you think the Cervell team made mistakes or were those on purpose? It's hard to Good say. Question. But- I, I, I think that it was probably mistakes, but it may have been sort of almost Freudian mistakes. <laughs> you know? Yeah, they wanted it to be that way well, yeah like where you started out look at the news stories and the headlines that came out of that yeah you know that went out to the public oh this was wrong there's no comment it's right right disproved yeah it's, it's like if somebody did right. that paper to be able to write those articles yeah right and see so when you you saw that head the experts have now weighed in right and, right well who are those experts experts are what i was just quoting to you that's the cervell paper right there see those are the experts but so the Firestone team, the Lecomte team, what are they? Yeah. Apparently they're not included in, they're not the experts, you see? Right. The so, experts yeah. are only on the side of the standard model. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I'm going to go conspiracy on this. Yeah. Stories were already written. Yeah. They needed the peer review paper to publish those stories. Yeah. So they went out and got one. Yeah. Maybe. Um, uh, you know, I'm going to give the, I, well, I'm actually, you know, uh, I think that basically it's it's kind of a they're they're reacting to this new evidence that is upsetting the apple cart. Yeah. Because what we see is within the last decade, 20 years or so, we see the idea of human overkill, the human caused mass extinction, which was rapidly falling into disfavor, suddenly revived within the last 20 years or so. And we also see that being invoked repeatedly um, as, as prima facie evidence that, yes, humans um, have caused mass extinctions before. Yeah. And this supports the conclusion that we are now triggering another mass extinction, a sixth great mass extinction that is equivalent in magnitude, severity, um, abruptness, and so on is the great five. which. I think would be uh, very important to evaluate that at the same level of detail that we're evaluating this. Because see, here's the thing. The purveyors of propaganda are not counting on the average person. The average person is going to see that headline, experts disprove, right? They're not going to go in to the level of detail that we just engaged in here. Right. And so they're not going to, they're not going to understand the, you know, the, the nuances and the subtleties of, right. of these controversies, see? And then when the, the LeCompte paper comes out, there are no headlines that say yeah, this paper disproved. was disproved, yeah. you know? The disproof was disproven. Yeah, they yeah, don't right. Yeah, the the, de- the debunkers that. were debunked. Right. They don't have those headlines, those giant articles, those huge, you know, it, it doesn't happen in the other direction. That's the problem. Part yeah. Yeah. Huge conspiracy. It's massive giant conspiracy <laughs> wow. uh, uh, all right i'm 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 gonna i've been silent most of this time but i'm, I'm gonna weigh in here oh um, here we go here we all go. right you guys <laughs> get, get, i'm getting right. situated here as 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 a recovering journalist and someone who's, <laughs> who's worked for major news, news organizations um i'm gonna say this it's not a conspiracy what it is is laziness um people who are when when you get people who are writing in 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 very specialist fields they're not specialists themselves but they're relying on other specialists they're relying on the boslos they're relying on the, the firestones and what the news media media is interested in is conflict it's it's interested in a story okay what 
what drives every story on television and print, whatever is, you know, is the, what is the story? Is the story, does the story have conflict? When somebody says, well, I've disproven a theory, it's great copy. All yeah. right. There's no, conspiracy. I agree with that. There's no conspiracy there. It's just, it's just, it is, however, a, a form of laziness. So intellectual, if, it, if, intellectual they like, laziness. if they like the conflict, then how come they don't continue it by saying, Oh, look, Somebody no, has because, come in and disproven the debunkers. Even more well, complicated. Because, now there's a real fight. Because because Firestone and and Le Confinal don't have good PR people. They don't have as oh. PR people as good as the other guys. The, the establishment has better PR people. Okay. Uh, I can buy that. I'll uh, buy it. PR people. <laughs> yeah. You know who you are. Contact get Firestone work. at all. Let's get, um, get in the game yeah. here. Um, well, it, it, now, it, 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 as far as... as as uh, as um, Cervell's paper, and my guess there is they weren't looking real hard. You know, but yeah, that that's what comes out clear from this. They weren't they trying weren't, too hard. Yeah, they, right. they weren't trying hard enough. They were I trying. Mean, didn't they use they were, optical microscopes? They didn't use electron scan, yeah. didn't they? It was you know, optical. You, you, from from you know, and 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 you reading you Randall, you reading all this this academic stuff, and at some point it's mind numbing. What it comes down to is a pissing contest between two camps, and <laughs> and in the news stories, that's that's what matters is there's a pissing contest between two scientific camps, and they're gonna they're, they side with the establishment. Now, the uh, again going back to Cervell, it it seems to me that that they did just enough to confirm their 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 bias, and that was it. Yep. Yeah, I, I I pretty much agree with what you just said. I'm I'm not going to invoke any grand conspiracy here. Um, yeah, no, I don't yeah. Think laziness is job. clearly. Yeah, that we'll leave that to the shiny boys. <laughs> it's a huge conspiracy. Mike's in on it. Freaking journalist. Thanks for uh, <laughs> thanks for giving us a pro tip there, Mike. Though yeah, seriously, that was good. That was cool. Yeah, laziness. Yeah, and and and, and, yeah. and the lazy scenario is consistent with established models right mm -hmm. so basically there's a double reason i think you have two things working together they're not really interested in really getting into the fine points of these arguments pro and con no that's the kind of stuff that i love to do i love you know the the devil is in the details right and that's what I'm, we're showing here. It, truly, the devil is in the details. And if you don't get into the details, all you're going to see is this headline, experts, you know, disprove this and that. And, and that's your takeaway, see? Um, because there's a lot of people out there that I've seen comments and stuff. Oh, that Younger Dryas impact stuff has been disproven, blah, blah, blah. And, and they pick up on that and they run and they think they know what they're talking about, but they don't because they haven't done the detailed examination like we're doing here. Now we've just spent what an hour or some going through this, you know, and, and we'll probably spend at least one or two more episodes on the younger Dryas and we will barely get into the evidence that's, that's now accessible and available. Um, but we certainly could. And, and, you know, hopefully um, that's enough of the, the listeners out there, will get into and enjoy this level of detail because, you know, you're not going to solve a crime without looking very intensely at the specifics. Yeah. And, and, and even, even the critics though are willing to acknowledge, I, I you know, I right, right, We started this by that quote from C Vance Haynes where he said, yeah, something really did happen and we need to figure out what it is. Maybe it wasn't an impact. Maybe it was something else, but something happened. Yeah. So I think Mike, what you were saying, is it like is that quote uh, never ascribed to malice that which can be explained by incompetence? There you go, something like that. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> and then, and I think it's probably true in, in academics as well as in in journalism. Yeah. Okay. I like the conspiracy theory better, but you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll buy what you're saying, man. I'm buying it. We'll we'll go with it. We'll go with it for now. For now. <laughs> So I think we'll look at one more thing here before we wrap up. So here we have some micro photographs from the Topper site, the Blackwater Draw site, and the Pawpaw site, which I believe is in, uh, it's in Maryland. Okay, so let's take a look so that folks can see what some of these microspherals look like. 
Okay, so let's go to our screen share here. Just take it kind of slow, Randall. Don't jump around too fast because it is got a bit of a lag tonight. Yeah. Pow, pow. Um, we're not going to jump around too much. We're just going to look at this. So here's, like it says, some of the uh, displaying some of the wide range of surface microstructures indicative of melting and rapid quenching. Man. Top three are from above the debitage layer at topper. So in other words, just the, the debitage is the, the, the material left over from the cultural occupancy of the site, right? The, the, the making of the tools, the, the flint napping and all of that stuff. So right on top of it, you've got this layer of these microspherals that have um, characteristic, surface characteristics that would be consistent with, with melting and then rapid cooling, quen quenching, right? Then the second row is your black water draw. Um, and then the bottom is uh, the Paw Paw Cove. Notice some of these weird surface yeah. features that you see. Like craters in the making almost on those. Yeah, yeah. Frozen craters. Yeah, frozen secondary, secondary spherules on them or something. Yeah. The material adhered to it. The Paw Paw Cove site is an archaeological site on the coast of Talbot County, Maryland. The site was first identified in 1979, a complex of three locations on 500 meters of shoreline of Chesapeake Bay, at which stone artifacts with an estimated date of 11,500 to 10,500 before Common Era have been found. So, in other words, you got to add a couple of thousand years to the BCE. So that's from Wikipedia. Um, that's really cool looking stuff. Yeah. Now this this is a framboidal spheral, which is which is an or uh, they are chemically indistinguishable from apparently melted microspherals, but on the other hand, uh, at the Alcantara team reported that sulfur rich framboidal framboids from Lake Cuzio, Mexico, are chemically different. So these are some of the things that we see here. So we won't get back into this. We've already covered this. I just wanted people to see. Um, pictures, yeah, those are pictures of what some of these microspherals actually look like. On microscope. What else we got? By the time you guys see this, Randall's internet connection will be way more awesome. <laughs> yeah, we got well, a list of improvements to make, and we're slowly getting to them, and and that's that's probably next. Yeah, we've we've also got to make a uh, a board game. Cosmography of a board game. It's like Clue. Yeah. Jupiter did it with a comet at the YDB. <laughs> <laughs> so the following year, we have another team led by James H. Whitkey, published in 2013, also in Proceedings of the Nat National Academy of Sciences. And the title of their paper was Evidence for deposition of 10 million tons of impact spherules across four continents 12,800 years ago. Wow. And this is what they say. Airbursts by a fragmented comet or asteroid have been proposed as the younger Dryas onset, in parentheses 12.8 plus or minus 0.15 thousand years ago, based on identification of an assemblage of impact-related proxies, including microspherals, nanodiamonds, and iridium, distributed across four continents at the Younger Dryas boundary, spheral peaks have now been independently confirmed in eight studies, but unconfirmed in two others, resulting in continued dispute about their occurrence and distribution, and origin. So we looked at one of those other two, which was the Suravel team, and there was another one which actually based a lot of their conclusions upon the work of Suravel. So there you got it. Now you have eight teams which independently have found those proxies. So who are you going to have confidence in? You're going to have confidence in the debunkers or the debunkers of the debunkers. So 
Impact, they go on to say, impact-related spherules have long been considered one of the most distinctive proxies in support of an impact hypothesis. However, despite increasing evidence for YDB peaks in impact spherules, their presence and origin remain disputed. In the latest example of this dispute, Boslow and others stated that magnetic microspherules abundance results published by impact proponents have not been reproducible by other workers. And that, of course, is primarily referring to the Suravel team that we were just looking at in detail. Then the Whitkey paper goes on to say, however, Boslow and his other authors neglect to cite nine independent spheral studies on two continents that reported finding significant younger driest boundary spheral abundances as summarized in high profile previously published papers. So what they're saying, so here's the Boslow teams, correctly stating, oh yeah, there were two teams that didn't find stuff. And then they conveniently don't mention these other t independent teams that did find it. So Pretty yeah, I, I mean, at that point now, I'm kind of leaning towards almost a conspiracy idea. Oh yeah, conveniently neglected. Yeah. For their own purposes. Did we lose the uh, shiny boys? Yeah, our hosts have dropped out again. The technical issue, you think? You can't blame that on my computer, yep. right? Nope. No. Nope. Uh, well, I'd be curious to uh, to know what uh, what the debunkers hypothesize, what what they say, because you look at all this evidence, and like you said just a few minutes ago, there's obvious evidence something happened. You know, yeah. something major happened. You've got the the mass extinction of, of megafauna and humans you've got you know this black mat uh widely distributed you've got all these microspherules you've got you know a complete change regardless of the black mat a complete change in stratigraphy you know absolute complete change in stratigraphy um something happened and 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 the ice is gone so yeah so what what hypotheses can they make? You know, there, I, I understand that there's, you know, there's shocks theory about the solar flares. There's, you know, I guess uh, uh, Boslow has his theory about, you know, sky particulates, whatever. But it's, it's obvious that, that none of these other things really um, fulfill all these indicators of a, a major catastrophe. Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. So, so what do they say? And what do they say to replace it? Instead of just debunking the, the, the YDB theory, what do they say? Well, basically what it boils down to is that it was, these are just coincidental that, that um, you know, that, that yeah, they acknowledge these things happen, but you know, there's there's there's, no, there's, di no. there's there's different explanations for each one of these things. In other words, the pro the, the, the dominant explanation for the mass extinction is human hunting. Right. So that has nothing. You know, that's an explanation basically by itself. Right. Um, and and pretty much the same thing with with the others each, as each, well. Each one of these things has a separate explanation, but there's no comprehensive theory as yes. to what caused all of this. That's correct. Yes. So they're side so they're, they're essentially sidestepping the issue. Mm hmm. Yes. Okay. Yep. So Boslow comes from the camp or leads the camp that these are just very very rare occurrences, and there's really totally odds against that something this large would have happened this recently 12,000 years ago being recent well I think that's probably part of the assumption um yeah I, I would think so um and it just seems strange that he's been made or elected the the president or on the board of the asteroid awareness day that's on June 30th every year now internationally recognized by the UN Asteroid Awareness Day on June 30th, and you know, but he doesn't 
he doesn't want to promote that, hey, we've got evidence that this really happens recently and we do need to be aware of this, you know. Look at look at the devastating consequences it's had in the recent past and look at all these amazing evidence that, that points to it. And, and you're and saying that just, in reference to Boslow. Right. Yeah, it just seems backwards that – Well, you know, yeah, and, and I've no, – several comments that I've seen have – wondered about that yes i mean even george i think has raised that issue um yeah so um so you got another paper to pull up next next episode or we oh, we branch no we're, i think we direction? should we, i think we should you know cover i mean the, the younger driest thing is so so important that it would be worth spending at least one more episode um, just oh, so yeah. we have, have, have a record of it, okay. um, that people can refer to, because well, I'm guessing the majority of the people watching this have probably not read these papers we're quoting from, um, don't know the specifics of the controversy. I'm sure some of them do, but I'm going to guess most of them don't yet. And so we'll try to fill in the gaps so that, you know, the people who are listening here can kind of understand the nature of the controversy and when they see a headline saying something like well, experts have disproven or whatever it might say that some red flags will go off and they'll say, well, maybe, but maybe not. Um, and then those eight or nine papers in support, do you, do you want to get into those a little bit? Or I do want to get into those a little bit. Yes, sure, because, sure. because it absolutely, it, the more you get into it, really, the more interesting it gets. Absolutely. No question. And, um, and they're and they're not from just a small region, you know. You're getting into Central America, into South America. You mentioned last time uh, there's new evidence in uh, South Africa, right? Right. There's things across Northern Europe. So yeah, we can branch in and and show that these similar evidences are showing up, uh, you know, hemispherically, if not almost globally at this point. Right. And and yes, the, the, this this particular controversy to me is. I think historically looking back will be one of the most important and interesting controversies in the history of science. And I think it's also very valuable to, to get into it because, and, and first of all, nothing is definitive yet. The, you know, the, the, the scenario is still evolving. And, and like I said, some of the critics have used that against it because they have saying, well, the proponents haven't settled on a single coherent theory. As if, you know, discovering, you know, just going back again to the analogy of the KT boundary, going back 65 million years ago, oh, somebody, you know, the, the Alvarez team discovers the iridium layer at the, um, at the, at the KT boundary. Well, we're st the, the, the details of that Cretaceous tertiary event are still evolving now. What, 40 years later? Yeah, 40 years later right. after that initial. So imagine a team coming along in the year or two after. And their criticism of the KT boundary impact theory hypothesis is that, well, there's no coherent theory. You know, they, they, they are, they're, they, peop, the, the investigators are disagreeing. Therefore, we can dismiss the whole idea. That's in its essence, and I can provide the quotes where they're saying almost exactly that. And we will, we'll we get into that. Look, the Snake Brothers have returned. Yeah. Sorry what happened that. to you guys? It just did it get just too much for you to deal with, and you had to, <laughs> yeah, you yeah, had to uh, bow out for a momentarily to 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 collect yourselves. The conspirators shut us down. Yeah, right after I was I was uh, trashing your internet connection, our internet connection went bad. <laughs> well, hey, listen, that's karma. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, guys, it's midnight. Can we call this a wrap? I think yeah. we can. Thanks for waiting until we got back. Yeah. Thanks, we were, everybody. We were like, show's over, I guess. we gotta... It was fun bashing you. <laughs> You'll hear it later. Oh, they well, froze up again. Yeah, you guys just froze. Or oh, otherwise, geez. you're sitting really, really still. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. We're post-midnight here, Eastern time. That's funny. Look at, look at that. <laughs> Conspiracy jump back at them. Yeah, it's raining here where I am. I'm hearing it. Uh, you know, I've got a skylight over my head here, and so I can hear the rain beating down on the skylight. However, I don't think that's affecting what's happening with you guys in Texas. 
I'm assu assuming they can hear us. I don't know. No, they probably wiped out. Yeah. So yeah, we can we can chatter on here until they come back, or we can try to wrap this thing up. What do you think? Oh, I think we can wrap it up. Um, Russ likes to give the uh, email address, which is appropriate: cosmographia one six one eight at Gmail. Yeah. We're getting we're getting lots of emails and uh, quite a few good ones in there. And they're uh, back. Brad, you better shut. It. You better do the closing ceremonies, man. Cause I was I was in the process. I was okay, giving it a going. shot. Keep going. I was giving it a shot. Yeah, you guys, you guys froze up. You had funny looks on your faces, so we're gonna use that. We're just gonna. Well, that one's better. <laughs> so yeah, just giving out the email address and uh, lots of new Patreon supporters. We appreciate all that. Uh, Patreon.com/slash Randall Carlson. And uh, going to be good things coming out of that. We're, we're trying to put out uh, lots of the episodes quickly, so we're not giving anybody uh, early access. Uh, we're getting everybody access uh, as fast as possible right now as we work to catch up. Yeah, and there's lots of new and interesting things to get into. Um, but I think the stuff we are covering is, is very relevant and important. And, you know, I'll, I'll reiterate the, the, the importance of the Younger Dryas boundary stuff because it's so pivotal to everything. And we're going to be most definitely exploring. What I would like to say is that if you stay tuned to these podcasts over the, the months to come, you will get uh, what I'm going to try to do is what we're going to try to do. Our team effort is to present these uh, catas the evidence for, for ca catastrophes in Earth history, how that may have affected Earth history, and looking at the pros and cons back and forth, and then being able to raise questions. You know, for example, one of the, um, the criticisms of, of Graham Hancock's work, you know, typically his idea that there was a lost mother civilization, right? That's an idea worth exploring, and it's not pseudoscience to ask those questions i'm sorry you know the the the, the you know the so-called defenders of the uh the self-appointed defenders of orthodoxy think that you just to even raise those questions all we have to do now is invoke the magic power term pseudoscience and that we can all conveniently compartmentalize it put it out put it in the cabinet and close the door on it and forget about it but the reality is is there's just way too much now those cabinets are filled to overflowing with anomalous data and evidence that is not explainable by these the, by the by the orthodox models of our own history we cannot understand our own history without understanding the periods of great catastrophes that have punctuated earth history during the couple of hundred thousand years that we modern homo sapiens sapiens have been here. And when you begin to understand the severity and extent of these events that have swept over the planet periodically, of which the Younger Dryas boundary is the, the most prominent and the most recent, you begin to understand why things that may have been happening 20 or 30 or 40,000 years ago may have been erased from existence other than small bits and pieces, tantalizing evidence here and there. But what we're going to try to do is, is connect those dots in a, in a very rigorous way by not deviating, not abandoning the actual hard science, the peer-reviewed science, but by looking in depth at the peer-reviewed science, because most people do not understand what's in that literature and what the, what's going on with these controversies. And so I want to try to provide an antidote to the kinds of things where we just saw experts have proven that this didn't happen. And, and I think that's an important function of what we're trying to do here is to provide that antidote and to clear, clear the table of a lot of this stuff that, that they're using to conclude that there could have been nothing going on in prehistory that we haven't already figured out. Yeah. Yeah. So stay tuned, folks. Don't touch that dial. That's right. Great, great episode. Stick <laughs> around for what we dig into next. That's right. All right, gentlemen. Awesome. Good night. Fantastic episode. Good night.
Doug and Dave did not do all the crop circles. <laughs> This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast.